today is um, just to wake you up, right? Because otherwise you're going to go to sleep. Today is remember, remember the 5th of November. The world this evening, or possibly last night, hopefully not in that torrential rain, would have been stood looking up and looking to the skies to hope to see something beautiful as fireworks um, maybe burst into the night sky. We are heading out this evening for fireworks, um, as Joel is very excited um, to see them. So let's hope the weather holds off. So my title this morning is Remember, Remember to Look Up. As we learn to seek God first, our posture changes, as well as our perspective and how we see him. Our seeking directly affects our seeing. All we have to do is change our posture. I want to take us to Matthew um, this morning, Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 to 23, and I want to read it in the message version for you. And it says these words, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squintily eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. If you pull the blinds of your windows, what a dark life you will have. You will notice this morning the blinds are closed. And some people have said, oh, I just thought Mark forgot to pull the blinds up. <laughs> he hasn't. He's done it for a reason of which will be revealed. Matthew 6 tells us that our eyes are windows into our souls. Sometimes we need to clean the windows of our lives and refresh our perspective to see more clearly. The world issues cause many of us to look down, to be downcast, to keep our eyes on the ground instead of at God. And at this moment in time, as we watch the media, as we watch the news, it's easy to become overwhelmed because none of us have an answer. None of us know the answer to the conflicts that are going on in our world, the dark world that we are living in, the things that we are facing. So it's easy to become downcast and keep our eyes on the ground. But instead, we need to keep our eyes on God. We can sometimes become looking at things around us, some circumstances in front of us. We have been looking out of the windows of worry to the world around us instead of looking up to God. We need to change our attitude and the atmosphere around us. We need to change our posture and we need to look up. And how does looking up change things? My first point this morning is looking up widens our possibilities. When we look up, it widens our possibilities. I want to tell you a story this morning. Some of you may know the story. It's quite well known. We, um, me, and Mark, uh, me and Rob work at the same school, and uh, we have a deputy head at that school that quite likes this story. So we often hear it maybe twice or a few times in a year when he does an assembly. But the story goes like this. It's an old man who was doing a daily walk along the beach one morning when he spotted a young boy crouched by the water, scooping something up from the sand and throwing it back into the sea. The beach was normally empty that time of day, and so the old man stopped to watch for a while. He noticed that the boy kept on shuffling a little further down the beach and repeating the same action again and again and again. Stopping, scooping, throwing, moving. What are you doing there, boy, said the old man as he walked closer. I'm saving these starfish. 
that are stranded, replied the boy. If they stay on the beach, they will dry out and they will die. So I'm putting them back into the ocean so that they can live. The old man was silent for a few seconds. Young man, he said, on this stretch of the beach alone, there must be more than 100 stranded starfish. Around the next corner, there must be at least 1,000 more. And it goes on for miles and miles and miles. And I've done this walk every day for 10 years. And it's always the same. There must be millions of stranded <coughs> starfish. I hate to say it, but you're never going to make a difference. The boy replied, well, I just made a difference to that one. And he continued with his work. Sometimes what's going on around us can seem so overwhelming, like us doing something small is not going to make a big difference. But this little boy saw the small difference that he made. And although on the grand scheme of things, the man was like, you're not going to make a difference. To the one, he did. And we serve a God who is about the one. He cares about the one. And the one makes a difference. Some of us are facing situations at the moment that overwhelm us and make us want to bury our head in the sand. And there are circumstances that feel impossible to get through and shift our focus from God to earth. But one simple action can change this if we look up. Let's change our focus from the things around us and look up because we serve a God who is able, a God who is able to do more than abundantly we can ask or think. He is the God of the eternity. He is a God who is able. <laughs> And one simple action can change this. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 2, it says, again, I don't apologise, but I'm going to use the message version because I like the way it reads, but follow it in your translation. Colossians 3, 1 to 2, it says, So, if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up. Be alert to what is going on around you, around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. We cannot allow what is around us to cause us to shuffle around in life. The spiritual shuffle causes us to limit our landscape and not to look at the endless possibilities that we find in God. These times don't worry God. They don't scare God. He knew. He still has a plan to use it for good. And we can read about Abraham's struggle with the impossible situation in Genesis. He has been promised a child by God, but in his wife's old age, he began to doubt that he would have children of their own. And in Genesis 15, verse 4 to 5, it says these words. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky. Count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God tells Abraham to look up and showed him that he, was not, he must not confine himself to the place that made him forget the power of God. The power of a God that put those stars in the sky. God wants us to widen our possibilities and realise the potential around us. 
as we look up. Look up. In 2 Kings, we um, read about Elisha, surrounded by enemies. In verse 6, uh, chapter 6, sorry, overwhelmed by what he saw. He said, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? Elisha knew that this servant needed to have eyes open to the power and protection that was already around him. Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 to 17, it says, when the servant of man, the man of God, got up and went in early the next day, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall I do? And the servant asked, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with, with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Open our eyes, Lord, that we can see the possibilities and the potential that we have in you. Sometimes we become so overwhelmed with anxiety and worry that we need to lift our eyes to God to see the full potential of what he has for us and what he is able to do. There is more for us than against us because we have God on our side. My second point this morning says looking up awakens creativity. Growing up, and I'm going to have to be careful this morning telling you some stories about my childhood. My father is sat in the room. <laughs> Growing up, um, I was always, I was originally, I'm one of seven now, but originally there was three of us. Um, and um, growing up between my other two siblings, I was always known as the creative one. Um, comparing myself, I suppose, to my two more academically able um, siblings, and mainly as well, I had a lovely grandmother, who I'm going to talk a little bit more about later on in my sermon, um, who also liked to call me the creative one. And at the time, when I was younger, and she used to say, it's all right, Lydia, you're the creative one. I used to take it as a bit of a negative thing. And I never thought I could live up to her expectations. And that was her way of maybe saying to me, it's okay, you're the creative one. And in the modern world that we live, it has caused us to become spectators of of the world. We have media all around us. We have, for those that are linked in, we have social media that is constantly um, trying to tempt us to compare with one another. Oh, look at Sally down the road. She's just had a holiday in the sunshine. Oh, look at them. They've had a lovely summer holiday. Look at them. Look at what they did at Christmas. And sometimes we can begin to compare ourselves to one another of what we're doing and how we're living our lives and where they're going and what they're doing. But comparison is the killer of creativity. God is the great creator. And he made us, he made me in his image. He has the potential and creativity on each of, oh, let me start that again. He has put potential and creativity on the inside of each and every one of us. We are unique. God awakens our creativity when we look up to him. In him, we will find creative solutions for our home, for our family, for our career, for our relationships, and dare I say it, how we do church. That we would never find if we looked around at what everyone else was doing. 
He wants us to stop being spectators and start being creators. We were not made to be the next big church. We were not made to be um, a certain type of church. We were made to be what the storehouse is made to be with the unique individuals that God has placed in this time for such a time as this. This is why we're here. This is why we were born. To serve this wonderful town. And I'm biased because I've lived here for 37 years. And I've not got out yet. <laughs> But this is why we're here. God has a purpose for our lives. He has a plan. He's in control. He is the creator God. And we just have to look to him. Look to him. Throughout scripture we see that God finds creative ways and creative solutions to worldly problems. In the Gospels, we read about the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus wanted to awaken the creativity within his disciples. And he asked them, how do we solve this problem? And their answer was, let's send them all home. They wanted to give up. They're tired. Let's send them home. But yet another young boy. We see another young boy, just like the young boy that was saving the starfish, knew probably that his small lunch potentially wasn't going to feed all those people there. Wasn't going to make much of a difference. But he looked up and he gave what he had. And in Luke 9... Verse 16, it says that Jesus, taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, gave thanks and broke them. And whilst the disciples looked at the ground, Jesus looked up to God. And the greatest thing of this miracle is that, although it's entitled Jesus fed the 5,000, we know through scripture and there was more than 5,000. And we also know that Jesus didn't just feed the 5,000 or the more than 5,000. There was leftovers. God doesn't just meet our need exactly. He always has a way of providing more than we could ever ask or think. God can make a way where there seems to be no way. He can part seas. He can still storms. He can walk on water. He can bring solutions that no one else will suggest. The answers we need won't be found looking around, but only looking at him. Let's look up. Let's look up. My final point this morning is looking up increases humility. If we have to put on a performance <coughs> and the perfection on a pedestal, we have to, we have forgotten who God is. There's a scripture in the Bible that talks about where we put the light that we are shining. And this morning there is a light on the lower level of my table next to me. Perhaps in some of our lives we have placed things above where God is in our lives. And God's not where he is meant to be. Some things have been shaken and stripped down in some of the seasons of our lives. And they've needed to fall off. They've needed to fall off their pedestal if God didn't have the highest place. 
then they were the wrong things to be there. We can say that about relationships, we can say that about friendships, we can say that about things that are going on in our lives that maybe sometimes we think it is the right thing, but if we push the door and it doesn't open, then as, if we, as long as we've got God in the right place, then we know there's a reason for that. I'm a great believer that there's friendships in my life that have come along for seasons of my life, but then fallen away for reasons. Why? Because sometimes people don't understand that when you're in a relationship with God, and the things that you are called to do as a Christian, and the stances that we are asked by God to take, to be witnesses of who he is, some of those friendships fall away. And yes, it's painful. Yes, it's difficult. But we have to remain faithful to the God who is faithful. And place him where he should be. And that is before my marriage. That is before my children. That is before my family. That is even before the work that I do here as a calling to God. God's got to be first. He's got to be at the highest place of our pedestal. He's got to be there. And if he's not, then maybe there's some things in our lives that need to be shaken off. We shouldn't find our identity in a job, in a relationship or a platform. But instead, we should seek to only be known as son and daughters of the king. We need to surrender ourselves and our pride and put God back in his place. In Proverbs 22, verse 4, it says, Humility is the fear of the Lord. It wages our ri its, wa its wages are riches and honour and life. The pursuit of riches, honour and life only boasts our pride. And it gets in the way of our relationship with God. If we are in... More, if we are more concerned with the loss than the Lord, our possessions, than the Prince of Peace, then we need to reevaluate what we look to. Jesus, fully man, fully God, would look up to the Father and kneel down and surrender in humility. Jesus looked up to the Father. Jesus took the time to kneel down in humility. We should never get distracted to think that it's all about me or it's all about you. In um, the past few weeks, we've, um, or months, um, our parents, you know that Reuben is our oldest, he's 10, and um, he has hypoxic brain injury and lots of other labels. And um, in the past few months, as parents, we've been learning and we're constantly learning um, how to meet Reuben's needs and the right things to do. And he recently had an assessment um, where we then learned about um, pressure points and how putting pressure on some of these points helps Reuben to regulate himself and um, so he can maybe pay more attention, hopefully, to what is going on around him and to capture his attention. And one of those um, points, which I was fascinated by when she taught me, was the pressure point on our hand and putting the pressure on this particular bit of our palm. And, um, and if you do that with Reuben, she said, well, if you do it and you can't get his attention or his eye line, um, grab his hand, place, place your pressure, and then bring it up to his eye line. And it will draw his eye line to your eye line. And I thought, yeah, that won't work when he's like in his own little world, that won't work. So I did it once when I was saying, Reuben, 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 and he wasn't answering. I was like, right, I'll take his hand and I'll bring it up. And I brought it up and he followed his hand up to my eye line. And then I caught his attention. And we were be, I was be able to ask him whatever I was trying to ask him, which was probably to put his shoes on or his coat or something of that nature. 
Um, but that caught his attention, putting that small bit of pressure and bringing his, bringing his hand up to my eye line, brought his eye line, um, head up to, so we caught each other's attention. And sometimes um, you have to come back to activities and places that remind ourselves to humble ourselves of God's faithfulness. And we see in Moses, in this moment, it felt overwhelming in Exodus chapter 13, verse 9 to 13. <coughs> chapter 17, verse 9 to 13. And Moses humbled himself to listen to God. And it says these things, and then I'll come back to the story about Reuben in a minute. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff the staff of God, in my hand. So Joshua fought the Amalekites, and as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill, and as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands <coughs> grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held their hands up, on one, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites' armies with the sword. Moses lifted his staff high, lifting his eyes to God. When he knew that God was able, Lifting his staff in those moments of tiredness reminded him of God's faithfulness. The staff that Moses carried, that where he had seen God's power at work, when he struck the sea and it parted, when he struck the rock and water flowed, when he threw it to the ground and it turned into a serpent, Sometimes we need to come back to the faithfulness of God. Pick up our staff, whatever that is for you, to allow, to allow it to lift your eyes again. So just like Reuben needed me to take hold of his hand and lift his hand high to capture his eyesight, God said to Moses, Lift your eyes. And Moses lifted his staff because it reminded him of the faithfulness of God and it enabled him to lift his eyes to God. To lift his eyes to God. Perhaps to make this point a bit more that you would indulge me a bit more this morning to tell you some more about my grandmother. She um, was... She used to come to this house. Many of, some of you will know her. Um, she was my mother's mum. And many of you will know that my mum passed away when I was eight years old. And um, as I say, I always seeked, in a way, her approval, but it always felt like I was the creative one. And that didn't seem very positive to me all the time. And, she gave me this Bible. I now have a newer version because Reuben got hold of this Bible and it falls apart now. But she gave me this Bible on my 18th birthday. And I'm sure we've all got Bibles like this, even though they're falling apart. It's taken me through times of my life that God has spoken to me. There's moments highlighted in this Bible. And also in this Bible holds a letter. This letter was written by my grandmother, um, when I was in America on an internship. And I have a couple of these letters that she wrote to me, and I hold them in a box with many other memories that I have. Um, I know the art of letter writing has now gone out the window. So, um, and I would just like to read you part of this letter this morning um, to take my point and finish my sermon this morning. It says, how are you getting on with all your learning? 
you will um, being with others in, in another country have many new experiences and problems but the Lord will help you through and take it as a learning curve each time you have a big problem and ask the Lord to guide you through also sit down and think and ask the Lord what what am I learning through this don't be like the children of Israel going round and round and moaning and never entering into the promised land each problem will build strength and wisdom into your character and life so expect to learn and take problems as stepping stones to a full life and experience and don't forget to give yourself enough time to sleep always caring um then just think for a moment this is an old lady lying in bed in dorchester i'm in america thousands of miles away i was in bed one night before my birthday her birthday was in october and i was burdened for you i kept waking and praying for you as if you were in need of prayer the following day the burden had lifted and i was all night singing in my mind the chorus how great is our god and praying for you i do i do pray for you every night and every morning make the most of all your opportunities it will be nice to see you back keep seeking the lord he will guide you and bless you lots of love nanny now i don't read you that to um just indulge my my family i read it to you because there's moments like that where we see the faithfulness of god and to me personally my grandparents all four of them when it makes me think about them it makes me remember the faithfulness of god they were men and women to me that were heroes of the faith and we hold a word of god here full of men and women that were heroes of the faith it reminds me that god is faithful thousands of miles away i can't put a pinpoint of what was going on in that moment when i was in america and she was up praying but i know that god knows and i know that my nan was someone as much as maybe she didn't give me everything in life maybe of the acceptance that i wanted i know that she was a faithful woman of god and her prayer life was faithful And in these moments, just like Moses, we can feel tired, we can feel old, we can feel weary, but we have to come back to God and lift our eyes in those moments to a God who is able. And Moses knew that God was able, and he then was reminded, actually, because I'm going to have to stay here for a while until we win this war, I'm going to lift that staff high. And whatever your staff is, I believe it probably is the word of God. And whether it's a particular Bible that reminds you of the faithfulness of God, whether it's a letter, whether it's a prophecy, whether it's just a message that reminds you, a testimony that reminds you of the faithfulness of God, just like Moses lifted his staff, lift your staff in your moment, in your, in your quiet time, in your little room, wherever you need to be reminded to lift your eyes, lift your staff high, because our God is faithful. Amen. Our God is faithful. And we could take so much out of this scripture that say, yes, this tells us that God is a God that wants community because Aaron and her were there holding Moses. And that's why we're part of a family of God, because we have to, at times, hold one another. Or we could take the moment that Moses felt tired and he sat on a rock. It reminds us that we need to be based on a firm foundation. We could take all those messages, and I could probably preach another sermon on all of that. But let's just take a moment to think about that stuff. To think about as Moses held it high, just as I lift Reuben's hand high to lift his eye level. This was Moses' stuff that reminded him of God's faithfulness. And we live in a world and in a time that we have it all documented, all written. God's faithfulness of who he is through time, through generations. He is able. He is faithful. 
So in a world that maybe seems dark, let's humble ourselves and remember it's nothing to do with us. As Moses grew tired and his arms dropped, the Amalekites began to win the war and then he remembered it's not about me, it's about him. Because he is a God who is able to do more than he can exceedingly ask or imagine. Let's lift our hands to him. To draw our eyes to a God who is able, who is faithful. If Jesus can humble himself, then so can we. So some of us may need to take a step outside and look up today. And remember God the creator, the place those stars in the sky. Some of us may need to start dreaming again and look up and not just look around us but know the small things we have are enough for him as we look up it broadens our perspective and some of us need to put God back on his rightful place thank you Denise some of us need to remember the potential again and others need to be surrounded by who he is the faithfulness of God let's take a moment to stand and change our posture this morning Not to be overwhelmed by what's ahead, but to look up. <laughs> look up to a God who is able. <laughs> to a creator God. As the world will look up this evening just to colours in the sky, we know that when we look up and we fix our eyes on the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we change our posture, it awakens creativity, it increases our humility. and it widens <coughs> our possibilities and perspective. If we didn't look up this morning, we would miss the beautiful display that is just an illustration in this room this morning. But yet God has so much beauty in store for us. He has so much potential in store for each and every one of us. So let's not in this world that feels maybe so dark forget that the light of the world is still on the throne. Amen. He's still in control. Amen. And he is able. Amen. Trust in his faithfulness. Amen. Trust in whom he is. <laughs> Take your stuff. Let it allow your eyes to be lifted to a God who is able, to a God who is faithful, to a God whose promises are yes and amen. Father God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that you ask us to follow you and to look to you. And this morning we do look to you. And Lord, we ask that you would challenge us here this morning, that if we need to dream again, that we would dream. If we need to broaden our perspective again, we would broaden our perspective. We need to be reminded of how mighty 
creator that you are. Lord, will we be reminded? And Lord, that we can do all of this by doing one simple thing, changing our posture and looking up to you, our God of faithfulness. Lord, I ask that the words that I have spoken here this morning, Lord, that you would challenge each and every one of them. Lord, you would take away the details that aren't needed, but Lord, the things that you want to say, Lord, will be left behind, ringing in each of our ears of what we need to do to become more like you, to change our posture, so that we would see your kingdom come. Lord, we want to see people come to you. We want to see, we want people to know the power of who you are and the potential that they have in you also. Because Lord, this isn't a group just here for us for this moment. Lord, it goes beyond these four walls. You love everyone. You died for everyone. Everyone has a potential in you. A life in you. Lord, will we be the hands and feet of Jesus? Will we seek you for creative solutions of how to grow this house, but grow your wider church. Lord, would you be with us now as we leave this place and go into our everyday lives of work, family. Lord, would you go with us? Would you go before us? That we would see your power at work that we would continue to come back here Sunday after Sunday, hearing testimonies of what you've done and who you are. Lord, we ask this of you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.